Quinton here makes sustainable clothing. Yep. His shipping company FedEx has set a goal of having carbon neutral operations by 2040. Great news. This sustainability effort makes Quinton very happy. Nice. FedEx, where now meets next. Today on CityCast Chicago, it's almost the first of the month, so you know what that means. It's time to pay your rent. But do you know your rights as a renter in Chicago? You and the CityCast Chicago team had a lot of questions, so we asked an advocate for some tips. It's Tuesday, May 30th. I'm Jacoby Cochran, and this is what Chicago is talking about. I'm here with my friends, lead producer Simone Alisea, and our fantastic newsletter editor, Sydney Madden. Welcome back to the mic, y'all. Hey, Jacoby. Hey. Uh, all three of us are renters. Uh, Simone, I'm going to start with you. What's been your experience renting in Chicago? Yeah, I mean, I will say Chicago rents are at least a little lower than uh, West Coast Seattle rents. So there's there's that I appreciate. But like I live in like a like a big building, like a really big building with a lot of tenants owned by like a big kind of corporate property management company. And so, you know, compared to like places I lived in in Seattle where it was just like a local like I knew my landlord and I would like text them all the time, like my property manager here. It's like this very like separate <laughs> process. Computer anytime. system, you got to yeah. log into the system. You got to put in a request. You got to yes. do the whole, <laughs> the whole process. I got you. And so sometimes it can be hard, I think, as a renter, even if you know what your rights are, especially when you've got like a big entity like that and it's not just like, you know, someone you're mm-hmm. texting or whatever, it can be hard to kind of be like, wait, can I ask for this? Or what should I ask for? Or what can I say in my lease? Um, it can It can be intimidating. No, I completely relate to that. In my adult years here in the city, I have lived in sort of a a mom and pop owned building where, like you said, you could just like text your landlord. They send out their homies to fix whatever your problem is. You know, some sometimes uh, like the communication could like take a little bit longer. Um, I've also lived with right now. I live in a huge building in High Park. It's about 10 floors ran by one of the huge property owners in our neighborhood's But I've also lived in like a building where everyone was a condo owner and Mm. he was just subleasing his apartment to us or his condo. So he didn't really have any like maintenance background or any landlord background. So when we would text him, he was very much like, bro, like call Mm. to call to other people. I ain't got nothing to do with this. (laughs) Uh, Sydney, what have been your experiences written in, in the city? Yeah, exactly what you're just talking about. Uh, I live in this high rise in Lakeview and I rent from um, a condo owner. She actually doesn't live here. She's based in Colorado. Mm. Um, So getting in touch with her can be kind of tricky. And she's ghosted me for a few months before and that's been kind of weird. (laughs) Um, Luckily, nothing's been too bad where I've needed her help immediately. I I think things could be better for sure. Like she's not... She's not the greatest, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love, though, that at the, just at the start of this conversation, we've already kind of gotten into some of the basic differences because it's easy to like break down into like homeowners and renters. But it's so much more complicated than that. Right. Simone, you talk with someone who can help us out with our rent questions. Who did you speak to? Yeah, so I called up John Bartlett, who's the executive director of the Metropolitan Tenants Organization here in Chicago. They pretty much answer all renters' rights questions, and they help people with evictions, that kind of thing. Um, okay. And, you know, for the most part, we were talking about sort of your typical lease agreement kind of rent situations. Obviously, people fall into all diff- kinds of different categories. Um, but the very first thing I asked him is I was like, okay, so what's the what's the most common question that you get? And it was the same most common question that we got from listeners and among ourselves, which is, uh, what are landlords responsible for fixing in Chicago? And here's what he said. Landlords are supposed to maintain the unit to the building code, which means any part of the structure, they're supposed to maintain the inside unit so that it's there's no water laying around, that you know, that there's no holes, that heat's working, the water's working, the electricity works, you know, all those basic things. I would say they also have to maintain the outside of the premises so that there's no holes in the foundation, no leaks in the roof. They also have to uh, maintain any appliances 
that they provide. Mm. That's the one that I'm typically calling my people about, right? I'm I don't really care if you cut the grass. Luckily, my grass seems to stay cut, right? The trash, <laughs> if it's not really windy outside, seems to stay in one place. But the one thing I'm constantly hitting people up for is like clogs in the shower. I just had to get my washer and dryer replaced, but it's been terrible the entire time I've been here. And they're only now, just now replacing it with, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, but I had to kind of stay on them over and over and over about this. Uh, Sydney, are, were you aware of all of the things that your landlord was responsible Responsible for? No, I was not. Um, and the math was mathing with uh, all the things he <laughs> said that a landlord will fix. Because when I moved in, I sent her a long list of things, you know, that needed to get done. And and in hearing that, it is interesting what she fixed and what she didn't fix. Like there were holes in the walls from you know, like hanging a lot of pictures, but also like mounting things, like mounting a TV. Just these like so, giant like, from holes. Previous people who yeah. were there, they didn't come in and like. I don't even know the right word. I'm going to just like say spackle the wall. Yeah, no, that's it. That's it. That's it. My G, you got me. I don't think, I don't think she even came back in between the people like uh, with the last tenants and me. Um, but she fixed the holes in the walls. She fixed my dishwasher. Um, but she like, we have all these outlets that don't work. And then like she has these shades that don't go up and down, which is really annoying. And maybe that's because it's part of the building code like maybe that's not in the building code oh. and she's not legally uh responsible so that's interesting i think another thing that that perked my ears up too was sort of the outside of the premises in like terms of like the foundation and stuff like that i was out talking to somebody at a bar and i was telling them i was doing this and they were like what should you do if your apartment is like tilted as in like something is wrong with the foundation and like the apartment and what? it's like, like leaning tower move. of Jeffrey, what? Yeah, and I was like <laughs> I have to imagine they're responsible for that so I'll ask and I think you know certainly that would uh fall under this. Another thing that John mentioned too is they're also responsible for pests. If you've got mice, roaches, bed bugs, whatever, your landlord has to pay to to exterminate those. Uh, you have both have very scared faces <laughs> on right now no, when I mentioned I, pests. Honestly, I, I'm glad you, br I mean, just naturally, uh, you know, pests kind of bug me. Um, <laughs> but I've had different experiences. I, let's just talk about it. You live in Chicago, more than likely, your building is in some way compromised. I'm going to just keep it real <laughs> with you. Like, yeah. they were here before us. Bugs know how to get in. Mice Rats know too. how to get in. I had one landlord when I lived at South Shore, or it was the building, uh, the maintenance guy, and he looked at me, and he was just like, hey, you live in an old building on the south side. It's going to have some roaches in here. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, sir... I appreciate your candidness, man, but that's not what I'm trying to hear <laughs> right now. That's not how this man. works. <laughs> <laughs> we got a question about this from a listener, uh, Shannon Woodlawn, um, who who asked, you know, if tenants have the right to request an inspection. And one thing you can do is uh, you can go to 311 and ask the city to do a building inspection. And that's for stuff like fire safety, too, things like that. That's what I was uh, thinking. But that said, John told me that, you know, even though tenants can do that, sometimes it takes a while for the city inspector to come out, sometimes up to a month or, or more. Um, and sometimes there can be miscommunication of like the inspector doesn't tell the tenant that they're coming. The tenant's not home. So the inspection doesn't happen. <sighs> so it's an option, but sometimes it can be better to try to negotiate with your landlord directly. But mm -hmm. but it is an option for for folks. So what should people do if your landlord isn't doing those things? They're ghosting you, waiting a long time or or not fixing them in a way that, you know, is, is like long lasting, like they just have to come back and do it again. I would say the theme of my conversation with John is basically document everything and negotiate. Here's what he said. I would take photographs, pictures, whatever they can do to show that the problem exists. And then I would start out by sending the landlord a letter telling them we have a problem and here's a picture of it so that you could see that. Now, it depends on how, I would say, uh, aggressive the tenant wants to be. They could make that into a 14-day letter telling the landlord you have 14 days to fix it or I'm going to either have somebody come out and repair it, take it off the rent, or I'm going to start reducing the rent, or if you want to get out of the lease, 
that would be another option that you could do. Man, I always wonder, like, how aggressive should I be? I remember when I had a leak in my shower from the apartment above and I reached out to maintenance people. And I'm going to be real for things like in unit flooding. People typically respond pretty quickly because they know that those costs can um, like well, ramp that up devalues quick. their property, too. Right. Like they, exactly. this is an asset for them. But once they fixed it, like the repair work ended up like taking out the glaze in my shower. Things started peeling. There was a hole in my ceiling for at least a month and a half, because at that point I had been sending in these requests like, all right, you all did this construction. Well, now you need to like finish the job. And at that point, they just completely slowed down. And I was like, well, do I just keep taking pictures? Do I just keep sending them? I didn't really realize you could start pushing the 14 day thing, but yeah, that that was one that I needed to to probably like put some fire under their ass a little bit earlier. Simone, I wanted to ask, why 14 days? Is that in the city code? Yeah, that is just part of your rights as a oh. renter is you can send that 14 day letter and say the landlord has 14 days to fix whatever issue. I think the thing that surprised me the most, I didn't know you could do this, is like if you do have something that for whatever reason your landlord is not fixing, not hiring someone to fix, like your burner is broken or something small like that, you can just hire someone to do it and then deduct it off your rent. I think John told me it was up to half of your monthly rent or $500, whichever is greater. Oh. And so, you know, John sort of recommended like maybe at first you just kind of tell your landlord that's happening. But if it becomes a persistent problem, like you send that 14 day letter and when you send that letter, you kind of have to say what the consequences are if the landlord doesn't do it. So, you know, you're going to take the repairs out of your rent. You're going to start withholding rent or you're you're attempting to get out of the lease. Those are things you can say that you're going to do that will be consequences for the landlord. You know, sometimes just like flexing your rights, letting them know that you're not just going to be one of the thousand people on their ledger who aren't going to ask for things. Because, you know, human beings will just like suffer through things. And if you will, people will take advantage of that. And if you put a little bit of fire on some of these landlords, they they are more willing to, to respond with you. So definitely stand up for yourself. So I'm glad we're having this conversation. Hey, City Cash Chicago, it's Michael Zibiak. While CityCast Chicago works hard every day to connect you with the stories that matter most, I'm working in the background making sure that our listeners are connecting with the best that Chicago has to offer. So what does that look like? It means meeting with the people who make Chicago what it is. The business owners, the stakeholders, the decision makers, the Chicagoans who put together those food festivals you enjoy, the concerts you attend, the exhibits you can't miss, and who make those candles your mom can't stop talking about. If this sounds like you, let me help you get your message out to the city's best audience with an ad right here on the CityCast Chicago podcast and on our sister daily newsletter, Hey Chicago. Shoot me an email at ads at citycast.fm and let's connect. Those are some great tips for the building you already live in. But summer is a time when a lot of people start apartment hunting. Are there any sneaky clauses people should be looking out uh, in their new leases? Yeah, for sure. Um, so a couple clauses that aren't so sneaky, but are good to watch out for are just like, you know, no smoking clauses. Like even if you have, for example, like a medical marijuana card, like that no smoking uh, clause in your lease still applies to you. You're still not supposed to smoke inside. So it's something to look out for. Pets too. Like, uh, you know, obviously that's something that landlords can do. But apparently John was saying that, you know, if if you do have sort of medical documentation that your pet is you know, a, a service animal um, or of some kind that you, even if you're, the building has a no pets clause, they can't bar you from having that service animal. So if that mm -hmm. is a case for you, that's something to look out for. But here are some sort of actual kind of sneaky, sketchy clauses that, that you should be on the lookout for. Well, I, I would always watch out as to giving the landlord the right to terminate the lease in a shorter period of time than the tenant. You know, we've seen a lot of landlords try to add in these add as is clauses, like you have to take it as is, but they are basically illegal and it, it doesn't matter whether they're in the lease or not in the lease. They can't say that, you know, by the way, the uh, door doesn't lock or they can't say, oh, there's a crack in the window and we're not, you know, it, it's they need to maintain it to the um, building code 
interestingly enough, those early clauses, those are probably the ones I would definitely try and I'm going to test you a little bit. Like, we have, like, <laughs> cat sit it and dog sit it for friends before in our apartment. <laughs> don't tell nobody. And we'll just see what happens. There are a lot of dogs in my building, so I really don't know how they're managing or checking or if people are telling. You know, I was in this building during the pandemic, so a lot of new puppies was running through our elevators. But... Yeah, my building is so big. I feel like they never they always send out like a blanket like, hey, remember, this is a no smoking building, but it's like they could never actually say what unit (laughs) the smoke was coming from. (laughs) Never Uh, at all. (laughs) uh, The one that stuck out to me that John said was that that other one about um, when you can terminate the lease. So like that Mm -hmm. what he's talking about, there is a clause where like the landlord might say, Okay, the tenant has to give me three months notice before their plant they're going to terminate or, you know, they're not going to renew or whatever. Uh, But I only have to give one month's notice if I want to terminate the lease. That can be really, really tough when like if you've got a life change or whatever, you've got a real reason you want to terminate and you're trying to negotiate that. And if you've signed a, a binding lease that has those that has those clauses that can be tricky. Yeah, those are definitely one of the ones I sort of glaze over and it's just like initial JRC. Initial <laughs> JRC. Initial so it's like bed bugs, JRC. Mm-mm. Something about lead in the walls, JRC. <laughs> but then one I'm definitely stopping on and I'm reading thoroughly is rent increases. Mm. Because from building to building, I have had landlords tell me from year to year that I'm going to have to pay $150 more or $200 more things that were either in my lease or were never in my lease. And more times than not, I don't push back. So are there any rules in Chicago limiting how much landlords can increase rent or how much notice they have to give? There is no limit on how much they can increase rent. They they can... (laughs) Because they can, there's no rent control. They can increase oh it by God. whatever amount mm-hmm. they so desire. <laughs> um, but the good news is, we there actually was a relatively new law that was passed that does have to do with uh, notice um, for uh, increasing rent. And so landlords do have to notify you. The longer you've lived in a building, the more notice they have to give you. So if you've lived in a building, uh, oh. you know, for several years, they might have to give you up to 120 days notice. So that's four months notice of of when your rent is going to increase. And, you know, if you've lived there for something like three years, it's like 90 days. And then, uh, you know, it kind of goes down from there. And a lot of landlords don't realize that that new law is in effect. And so that is something that you can tell your landlord if you've lived in a place for a while and they're trying to increase your rent, you can say, hey, you didn't give me enough notice about this. And you can start a negotiation from there. Do they have to explain why? Because I'm doing like a rough estimate in my head, like my building. I had to pay 150 more dollars. I didn't get anything new in my apartment, in my building. If there are 90 units in my building and say everyone is just estimate $150 increase, that's nearly $14,000 more. Do they have to explain to anybody, the city tenants, what that money's going towards? As I understand, they don't have to tell you, but those are questions you can ask and you can challenge Mm -hmm. your landlord on. Um, And again, it's something you can negotiate. I had a friend who just, you know, got a, his landlord was telling him that, you know, we're going to increase your rent by some exorbitant amount. And he was able to negotiate it to go down by saying, hey, I've been a really good tenant for a few years. I pay my rent on time. Like, is there any way we can lower this? And John was saying that a lot of times the amount they're raising it by is more than what they actually need to cover any cost increases. Another thing that is illegal is they can't raise your rent in retaliation. So if you are, you know, constantly on them about repairs that they're not making or you're bugging them somehow, they can't be like, oh, well, I'm going to raise your rent because you're an annoying tenant. And, you know, one way of figuring that out is like maybe if you are cool with your neighbors is seeing if your neighbors got similar rent increases to you. Mm -hmm. And if yours is like crazy high, then there might be something weird going on there. These are all great things to know, but it seems like a lot of this really falls on the tenant to kind of assert their rights, be a little bit more aggressive, let the landlord know that, you know, you ain't going for the foolishness. Did you not have any tips about how or when you should get help? Ask somebody else. Yes, he did. I would say certainly once the landlords file any type of eviction, you know, against the tenant, I would say 
it's not advisable to take that on by yourself. The other thing that we, I, I didn't add, but we regularly uh, encourage tenants to do in larger uh, buildings is to actually organize tenant associations. Because we found that when tenants work together, one, it's building this internal support so that there's more than one of you doing this. And then it also gets the landlord uh, more is more likely to respond once it, if it's a group of tenants and just a single tenant because it, you know there's power in numbers. I, I think landlords will do things in order to avoid court and avoid other issues. So you know I'm, I'm one that thinks you always negotiate with the landlord. You raise things up and ask them because if you don't, then you're certainly not going to get what you want. For me, the what he was saying about the organizing with with neighbors, like I had a terrible experience in college in, in Champaign with these bed bugs, and those people did not respond. It was through a company, the the building manager. He didn't even have his voicemail set up, so you couldn't get a hold of him. We didn't know anyone's last names at this company because they wouldn't give it out. Like, I can't believe they're in business. It was so sketchy. Um, but if I went college to the, town renting is gotta be one of the shadiest businesses boy peoria oh my god <laughs> yes. the, those people just they knew they were exploiting us they, they were just like sure we don't care yeah and the the this building the reviews people would talk like i had bed bugs people were talking about like rats running through the build like it was terrible um and i just think if you know if i had had the sense at the time to to you know kind of united with other people going through the same thing in the building you know that could have had more impact than me just calling every day and nothing really getting done. Um, getting so nowhere. yeah, the, this conversation is super helpful. I know John works for the Metropolitan Tenants Organization. Is that an organization that people can go to to get like more of this information? Because I'm thinking like beyond asserting for yourself, I know that if I wanted to, you know, maybe bring a lawyer in or bring in an organization, I have friends, I have connections, but I imagine for a lot of people in Chicago, if they're living in buildings that are owned by individuals and probably even some maybe shadier companies that they're not aware of this, is there any places they can go that will sort of make them more hip to this information? Yeah, MTO is definitely one of those places. They also have a hotline you can call 773-292-4988, but there are um, lots of renter rights uh, orgs. Some of them are neighborhood specific. So you might have a spot in your neighborhood. Um, you know, there's uh, certainly uh, no shortage of, of people who are knowledgeable on this issue. Well, we hope for some CityCast listeners uh, that this conversation was uh, meaningful and productive. And we'll drop more information about MTO in the show notes, including giving you that hotline number again. Simone, Sydney, I appreciate y'all making time. Thank you, Jacoby. Thanks. Before I let you go, a little bit of news, y'all. City Council will meet tomorrow, and they're expected to vote on a $51 million effort to provide more shelter and resources for arriving asylum seekers. In case you missed it, state lawmakers extended their deadline to finalize a new Chicago school board map they now have until April of next year. Critics argue previous drafts lacked fair representation and transparency. And some good news. Join me Thursday for the Chicago Readers Best of Chicago Party at Metro and Lakeview. I'm going to be hosting. There'll also be a VIP pregame at G-Man Tavern and a pride kickoff party after at Smart Bar. Tickets are available in the show notes. And you can use the code SAVE5BOC for a discount. As always, we appreciate you for listening. Subscribe to our daily newsletter, Hey Chicago, at chicago.citycast.fm. I'm going to talk to you bright and early tomorrow. Peace.